Yeah, well, thank you so much. It's a great uh, privilege to be here. Um, I know how good your, uh, your pastors teach, so uh, I just hope that I can add something uh, to that. <laughs> no, seriously, I know you guys are good. You guys are really good. Well, it's great to have my wife with me. She doesn't always travel with me. Bobby, would you just stand up just to honor you tonight? <laughs> Hallelujah. Such a blessing. We'll be married, I think it's 50 years next year. Yeah, so uh, we've got four children, all married, eight grandchildren, all fall in the Lord. So it's all good. Amen? It doesn't have to be bad. It's all good. Praise the Lord. So, uh, so it's, it's really a privilege to, uh, to chat uh, to you tonight about the subject of worship. And uh, there's a lot I'd like to cover over the next uh, today and then, uh, and then on Sunday. So I guess we'll get right into it. Should we just pray quickly? Father, we just thank you for your word. Father, help me communicate that which is on your heart. Father, make it meaningful to your precious people. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. I will talk quickly about these books. This is a, a book we've just published. Um, uh, actually, just to, I think it's probably uh, two months. But this book is an incredible story. It's a true story. And it's about how I met my biological mother. I was adopted, and uh, I'd never met my real mother. And uh, my, uh, I, was on a, I was going back to Scotland. This is a Scottish accent, by the way. I hope you got that right. Um, I was going back to Scotland for a, 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 a seminar. Um, and my daughter said to me as I was leaving, we were living in San Diego. She said, Dad, would you try and see your mother? And I said, oh, it's impossible. I'll get this seminar. And then I'm, you know, I'm just in Edinburgh for a weekend. And then uh, I go to England. And uh, she said, Dad, please try and look for your mother. And so I got on the plane from San Diego to London. And it was on my mind, you know, the whole time. It was like, wow, why did she say that? And then um, the whole night I was thinking about it. And then I went up to my friend in Scotland and uh, before we went to start the conference. And he... Uh, I just happened to say to him, I said, you know, um, um, you know, do you know where the birth, deaths, and marriages place is in Edinburgh? Because I was going through to Edinburgh. And he says, well, we had, some, uh, we had some people from America here, he said, just last week. And he said, they have got Scottish relatives. So uh, he says, the address is here. And it was actually, you know, a hand length from, arm length from, from where I was sitting. And uh, he says, there's the address there. So anyway... I took it, I met some friends who were traveling with me, and uh, the next five hours, well, it started that Friday, but then on, on the Monday, five hours, I was miraculously, I was sitting across, I was in a room, and uh, the door flung open, and uh, my mother, my biological mother walked in uh, that I had never met. It's a series of miracles. It's a series of miracles, and the, the reason this book is so powerful I said, if you've never experienced a miraculous intervention of God in your life or ever doubted it, this book is for you. And so, you know, I, when I had that encounter, I said to the Lord, you know, people would hardly believe this took place. It's so miraculous. But it's a true story, right? I only write true stories. Thanks for your enthusiasm. I'll go this side. I only do true stories, man. I'm telling you, it's the truth. <laughs> All right, it's too late. You're too late. You should have got it the first time. So, uh, so, you know, so the couple that was with me, they said, you know, Tom, um, people would not believe unless there was witnesses, you know, actually what happened. It was miraculous. So anyway, there's that book for you. And then I wrote this book called Worship Heals. There's a connection between worship and healing. And it's in this book. And in this book here is um, called The Worshiping You. This is a, a look into, I guess, you know, how the church will look just before Jesus comes back. And uh, it's a prophetic uh, insight into that. And so uh, everything's beginning to line up. So anyway, those are those three books. Praise the Lord. All right. Hallelujah. So we're going to talk here about worship and, and warfare. And I'm going to lay some uh, foundations for you. Um, this subject is really, really important. The, the purpose of the church, basically, why the church exists, whether it's a local church or the church at large, is essentially to worship God. Everything else that the church does is peripheral to worship because we're actually created to worship and then to work. We're not created to work, if you know what I'm saying, for God and then worship. We're 
created to worship first and then work. So, so the central theme, I believe the central theme um, before Jesus comes back, which could be pretty soon, but the central theme of the church will be worship. It'll be a worshiping church. And then it's everything that flows from that. But you may think when I'm talking worship, I'm just talking about somebody singing for 20 minutes before the pastor preaches. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about the, the central theme of the Bible is essentially worship. That's what the whole Bible is really about. And from that, everything starts to flow. Evangelism flows from that. Healing flows from that. Deliverance flows from that. Everything flows from worship. When you get the worship thing right, you'll get everything else right. Amen? So, um, so that's, that's why the church exists. Now, I, I want to just mention this with it going into because I don't have time. Worship is so important that it could actually affect the timetable of the return of the Lord. It is that important. And the reason I say that with it going into it, there is something in the Bible called the tabernacle of, or the, the restoration of the tabernacle of David. A lot of Christians don't really know what that is. A lot of pastors don't know what that is. But it's mentioned quite a bit in Acts 15 and leading up to Acts 15. And it talks there about the restoration of the tabernacle of David. Now, um, I, do, sir, I do a series of things on this. I actually do seminars on this subject. It's so profound, the subject. But I'll just mention it to you in relation to what I, the foundation I want to lay tonight is that the, it's interesting when they talk about the restoration of the tabernacle of David, he says there that God will restore the tabernacle of David, a prophecy from Amos, which is repeated in Acts. He says he will restore that which has fallen down. So what this is referring to is the tabernacle of David has been restored since the early church, but it will reach a climax before Jesus comes back, the restoration. Now, he talks there. This is a key to, to get insight into this whole thing. He talks about a church that has fallen down, but God will restore it. Thank God for that. Amen. So it's a prophetic picture of the, the state of the church before Jesus comes back. The church that we're currently living in, and this is not to get negative, but this is the truth, is we're living in a, in a time when the church has essentially fallen down. The church is not the glorious church yet, but it will become glorious. Can I get an amen? That was a good opportunity. It will become glorious, and, and you're the people that make it glorious. Amen? So, so in a sense, and I could, I could spend a lot of time going into this, but in a sense, what we're looking at is we're looking at a church at the moment that is in a fallen down state. We're doing our best. You know what I'm saying? We're doing good. But there'll come a time when God will just walk into the church, in a sense, and he'll do his part. And then you'll start to see the glorious end-time church. I mean, because I saw this, and I wrote it in this book here, The Worshipping You, many years ago. And I saw, I saw, I got a glimpse into that church in a 40-minute encounter with God in 84. And the Lord showed me, he says, the church will be so powerful. It'll all be around my presence. It'll all be because of me, not because he speakers. Amen. It'll be because of him. His presence will be so profound that people will be running to church. At the moment, yeah, I want to get that picture. At the moment, at the moment, we, uh, we do everything we can as pastors and we really work hard. I know that your pastors work very hard as well. We all work hard to get people to come to church. Isn't that right? And we should, right? We do everything we can, man to get people to come to church. But there will come a time when uh, it'll, God will just kind of step in and, uh, and it will be His presence that will attract people to church. If God can't attract them, no human being can attract them. Amen? And that's when we're going to see the miraculous stuff. We're going to start to see churches, churches like this, which is a reasonable-sized church, will be far too small to accommodate the, 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 the things that's going on centered around the presence of God. It's all going to be about the presence of God in the end times. Then you're going to get people uh, looking for churches. They're going to hear about the healings. And, and all this was taking place at the Tabernacle of David, by the way, which we don't have time to go into. But a lot of this stuff was taking place at the Tabernacle of David. And yet you'll find that um, churches will become uh, incredible healing centers where people will be bringing people from the hospitals into the local churches, and they'll be, they'll be getting healed. That uh, The church will probably be the most talked about thing in, in the whole planet they'll be talking about that doesn't mean everybody's going to get saved there's going to be persecution in the midst of that but the church is going to be very powerful people will be running for the presence 
of the Most High God. Amen. So, so, um, so it could affect the, the restoration of the tabernacle has got to happen before Jesus comes back. We've got to see the fullness of that because the restoration of the, the, David's tabernacle in the Old Testament was a type and shadow of the end time glorious church. That's exactly what it was. You'll just have to believe me for that without me having to explain that to you. But that's what it was. David actually saw a glimpse of, of, of the glorious heavenly state that the church would be in at the tabernacle of David. And it was just basically, there was no distractions, by the way. It was just him and, and, uh, and the Ark of the Covenant. The furniture had been taken away. They never put the furniture in that was in Moses' tabernacle. So there was no distractions. Amen. No, there's a lot of distractions in church. Amen. People come with all kinds of distractions. And, and even, you know, the things that we set up can be distractions. Um, but, but, but in David's time, there was no distractions. It was just basically David and God. And uh, he was responding to God's presence. We have this kind of wrong concept of worship. We think that we come to church. And if the music ministry is good enough, you know, it'll help us worship. But um, that would have been a foreign concept to King David. David. David was responding to the presence of God, not to try and get the presence of God. Amen. So what we try and do is we try and get the presence of God in our church. Amen. And that was totally foreign to David. That's why the rest of the, rest of the tabernacle of David will be because of God's presence. Amen. It'll be a responding to the presence of God that is already there. Some things are happening already in the world, which is, I just see reports coming from South Africa overnight there uh, of this kind of thing happening. I was in South Africa a few months ago and actually prophesied that to quite a large group um, that people would start to talk about South Africa and say the things that God is doing in South Africa. It's already beginning to happen. I'm telling you, some incredible things are beginning to happen there. So we, we start to see... Uh, insights into this. So, so this is the reason then, we're talking about worship and warfare. This is, this is one of the reasons why there is such a battle in the area of worship because it's linked to the prophetic timetable of the end time glorious church. This is why there is a battle. So um, it's always associated with, with uh, it's a battle of what I call thrones, a battle of thrones. Um, you know, throne, worship has always been associated with authority, authority worship. The two of them you can't separate. So Genesis 49, it talks about the scepter shall not depart from Judah. Judah means praise. So, so the devil is not frightened of our music ministry. He's not frightened of your singing or your songs. He's frightened of the authority that you carry because you're in the presence and you carry the presence of God. It's the authority that he scares. And when, you, when, you, um, when you're a worshiper and you prioritize worship, that is the kind of authority that you will carry. Amen. So that's going to be a glimpse in, into the end time church. So let me put it like this. Genesis chapter 4. Can we go there quickly? I'll lay this foundation. Um, in terms of uh, what was taking place here, you know the story of Cain and Abel. And I'll read it to you um, from verse 1, Genesis 4. I'll just go quickly through this. Now, Adam knew Eve, his wife, and she conceived and bore Cain and said, I have acquired a man from the Lord. Then she bore again, this time, his brother Abel. Now, Abel was a keeper of the sheep, and Cain was a tiller of the ground. So Abel was a shepherd, and Cain was a farmer. This is very important. Um, Abel was a shepherd, and Cain was a farmer. Verse 3, it says, and in the process of time, it came to pass that Cain brought an offering of the fruit of the ground to the Lord. Abel also brought of the firstborn of his flock and of their fat. And the Lord respected Abel and his offering, but he did not respect Cain and his offering. And Cain was very uh, angry, etc., etc. So I guess we know the story, right? So then he kills his brother. And then something happens here. In verse 12, I'll read it to you. It says, And when you till the ground, it shall no longer yield its strength. I'm going to focus on this whole area tonight. It shall no longer yield its strength to you, a fugitive and a vagabond. You shall be on the earth. 
The one translation there says that you will be, you will roam endlessly. In other words, you will be unproductive. You will be unproductive. Now, this is related to worship, and this is really, really important. So basically, the church is like a field. The church is like a field. It's like a battlefield. Amen. So your field, the church, will never experience transformation until the subject of worship is addressed. This is really important. It's the same in the life of the individual. Until you address the subject of worship, you will always be in a battle that you'll never win. Amen. You just, you just can't win this battle. The whole foundation of this whole thing is, is set here in Genesis chapter 4. So God threw Cain out of his field, right? That's what we read there. Um, and he became unproductive. It says in verse 16, it says, Then Cain went out from the presence of the Lord and dwelt in the land of Nod on the east. So he went out from the presence of the Lord, right? So he was in the field. The field was where he was, where he was supposed to be productive, right? But he brought the wrong offering. He didn't bring an acceptable offering to God. So God says, I cannot accept that offering. So you're going to roam endlessly. You're going to be unproductive. This is really, really important. So the whole thing about warfare, some people will just warfare, warfare, warfare. But if they don't undergird that with worship, then their lives, in a sense, will be unproductive. They will never come to the fullness of what God has got for them. Amen. They will never get that. This is why I went to a conference years ago, and it was a, it was a warfare conference, and they asked me to come, and I was the last speaker, and I went in there. And, jeez, uh, I walked into the place, and, 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 you know, everybody looked tired and sad, and they're fighting the enemy and binding the devil. And, and I'm looking at this, you know, I was that session before I spoke that night and I'm looking at everybody and it's like and so I got up in the evening and I said you know you guys look tired everybody looks tired man you're tired fighting the devil you're not supposed to be fighting the devil you're supposed to be worshiping the Lord here's how it works I'll lay this foundation we do warfare but most of the time we're supposed to be in worship and then occasionally we get into battles if you reverse that round if you're focused on warring 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 is because you have not prioritized worship. Amen. So, so, so we're supposed to we're supposed to worship constantly, and fight occasionally. Does that make sense? You're 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 basically designed to be a lover of God, to be a worshiper of God. But then there's these there's these seasons where. You come up against stuff, right? And I'll, I'll explain that as we go through throughout t today and, and, and Sunday. So, so we have to get that foundation right. You can't, if you're fighting the devil all... In other words, if you're fighting the devil all the time, you're more conscious of the devil than you are of God. It must be, right? If he's on... But if, you're, if, if you've reversed that, then you're more conscious of God than you are of the devil. Amen? So he get through. He get thrown out of his of his of the. I'll read. I'll read verse sixteen again. It says, "Then Cain went out from the presence of the Lord, and dwelt in the land of Nod on the east of Eden." So the presence of the Lord was in his field. Was in the field. So God's presence is where you're most productive. <laughs> the 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 the, pla the place of worship is going to be your place of productivity. Is anybody getting this, yeah? That's where you're going to be most productive than anywhere else when you prioritize worship. Amen. Things are going to start to be falling in place. So your productivity is based on worship, and your worship is essentially um, expressed as obedience. Now, there's some interesting things here. Um, I'm going to read this to you. We're going to go fast through a lot of this stuff. But um, worship and warfare will, will operate together. But again, I'm laying a foundation for you tonight. Let me read this amazing scripture to you. I only come across this recently. I'd, I'd read this scripture so many times. 
and never actually understood it. I'll read it to you. You can just make a mental note of it or whatever. But in 1 Chronicles 25 and verse 1, it says this. It says, Moreover, David and the captains of the army, David and the captains of the army separated for service some of the sons of Asaph and Heman and Jejuthun, who should prophesy with harp, stringed instruments, and cymbals. Now, this is a very interesting scripture. So David is setting up the whole, the whole tabernacle of David thing, right? So, so what, is he, what does he do? We know that in the tabernacle of David, 4,000 musicians. I don't know if you're aware of that. 4,000 musicians. So David was extravagant, man. You know, he wanted to be totally extravagant. That's why I say it's an insight into the end time, the end time worship and what the church will experience. It's all in there. But look, at, I'm going to read it again so we just grasp this. It says there, however, uh, moreover, David and the captains of the armies basically chose the musicians. This is very important. David alone did not choose the musicians for the temple. David and the captains of the armies chose the musicians. Why was that? Because it was important for them to be responsible as army people to make sure that the choice of musicians were the right ones. Why? Because when it went well in the temple, when the worship went well in the temple, the battle went well in the field. Yeah. Amen? Wow. Hallelujah. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> you can't reverse that. That's an amazing scripture right there. When it went well in the temple, the battle went well in the field. So these army officers, and then you, you can see this throughout Scripture. So, so they would go out knowing we've chosen the right guys. And actually the guys they chose were incredible. Because the guys they chose are Asaph, Heman, Jejith, and they were all prophets of God. They were very powerful uh, people. They were musical geniuses. One of them at least, Asaph. But they were also... Um, they, they knew, you know, the battle... See, see, this is powerful. David never lost a battle. I don't know if you're aware of this. The reason for that is because they chose the army guys had the confidence to fight because they knew that the worship was right in the temple. Amen? Because So the battle wasn't in the field. They had to fight. Yes, we have to fight. But the battle was in the taking care of in the temple. I'm going to teach you, I don't know when, but a lot of the warfare that we go through is totally, it's avoidable. You can avoid a lot of warfare that you're going through. So don't miss that session. I'm not sure when I'm going to do that. You can avoid a lot of the stuff that you fight through. It doesn't mean that we don't war. Of course we do. But a lot of the stuff we go through is totally avoidable. And I can give you scripture to back that up if we just know how. Amen. I thought someone should be excited about that. But that's okay. So, so warfare um, is unproductive without worship. I mean, look at what Judges says. It says in Judges 1, 1 and 2, it says, Now after the death of Joshua, it came to pass the children of Israel asked the Lord, saying, Who shall go first to go up for us against the Canaanites to fight for them? And the Lord said, Judah, which means praise. Judah shall go up. And Judah have declared the land into his hand. Things are declared into your hand in that place of praise and worship and thanksgiving. Things happen in that place. Amen. It's so important. Why? Because it's God's priority for your life. Listen. The, the, there is nothing you and I can do more than praise God and thank Him and worship Him. There's nothing you will ever do. You can raise a dead man. It's, it's, it's secondary to worship. You can do the greatest miracles. But if you've got the worship thing right, everything will start to go well. Amen. And I'm not trying to minimize warfare because we're going to get into warfare in a minute. But it's really, really important to see that. So, again, laying this foundation, there's a stirring... Uh, a prophetic stirring that is taking place right now in the body of Christ. Um, and God, 
<clears throat> well, we know, we know that the church is living in an, an incredible time. I mean, the world has gone crazy, right? So we're living in a world of total deception. Deception is ruling in the nations. But, but what's happening in the church to combat that is discernment. So when you've got deception happening in the world, everybody's deceived, all this crazy stuff. But in the church, there's got to be discernment. And I want to lay this quick little foundation of this before we move into any more of the warfare stuff. So <clears throat> listen to this. In Daniel 12, um, I'll read to you from, from verse 8 and 9. It says, Although I heard, I did not understand. Then I said, My Lord, what shall be the end of these things? And he said, Go your way, Daniel, for the words are closed up and sealed till the time of the end. The words are closed up and sealed until the time of the end. So he didn't quite understand, didn't quite grasp what the, the end days or the last days were about. Then in verse uh, in 4, further up there it goes on, and it says, But you, Daniel, shut up the words and seal the book until the time of the end. Many shall run to and fro, and knowledge shall increase. Many shall run to and fro, and knowledge shall shall increase. The Amplified Classic Version says, listen, run to and fro and search anxiously through the book. They will search anxiously through the book. Now, that running to and fro is not referring to travel. What that's referring to is searching for prophetic truth. You're going to start to see people actually looking for prophetic truth. What is it what I mean by that is, what is it that God is saying right now? How is Because we know things have gone crazy out there. How is God preparing us right now for what we've got to go through? This is happening at all kinds of levels, not just talking about churches, but, you know, talking about, um, you know, parents prophetically catching what God is saying regarding their families, you know? It, the, the, whole, the whole prophetic thing is going to get very sharp, right down to what schools do we send our kids to? You know, everything like that is going to become very, very sharp. But this here is talking about looking for prophetic truth. There's a lot of prophecy coming out right now, and we've got to get truth. And it says knowledge shall increase. Again, that's not referring to general knowledge, but knowledge of end-time prophecy. Amen. So only in, and all this has, has just been opened up since about 1948. Just listen to this quickly. In 1948... Um, end time prophecy started to accelerate. That's only, what, 75 years away, 75 years ago. End time prophecy started to accelerate. Um, look at the signs. 1948, Israel became a nation. Is that right? 1987, the J Jewish soldiers entered Jerusalem. I want to show you how these things are escalating. This is why we've got to pr be prophetically sharp. Amen. 1987, Jewish soldiers entered Jerusalem. 2017, the U.S. government recognized Jerusalem as the capital of Israel. Look at these signs that's happening before our eyes. Iran building nuclear weapons. USA taking a backseat in world affairs. These are things that are happening right now. Global pandemics, earthquakes, wars, call for globalism moving away from nationalism, preparing for a one-world government, preparing for a one-world currency. Now, why am I mentioning all these things? Because we as the church have got to be on top of a lot of this stuff. You know, we, you know well, these, we, we are getting inundated with this kind of news. Isn't that true? And it can be overwhelming at times. But, but the church has got to be saying, okay, God, what is it that you're saying to us? How do we prepare what are the mechanisms? What are the triggers that is going to cause the church to be glorious? And I may talk of uh, uh, some of those triggers. What is it, God? We've got to be sharp, man. We can't be just receiving all this negative talk that the world has given us and not being uh, prophetically smart and know exactly what God is saying. Not just at a global level, but at an individual level, at a local church level. God, what are you saying right now to me as an individual? a mother, a father, a grandmother, a grand... What are you saying right now? 
So the hope, you're going to start to find it. People will not be looking so much. We've, we've come through a bit of an era where people will run to hear prophets so they can get hands laid in them and they'll get a prophetic word for themselves and stuff like that. And that's fine. But it's, it'll move away from that. It'll move into how people are going to get downloads from heaven themselves. The Holy Spirit is going to start to speak to them about how you conduct your life. Amen. It's, it's going to shift because, because to be honest with you, it, a lot of people get prophetic words, hands laid in them by true prophets. They get prophetic words. Do you know that a lot of those things, most of them never come to pass? And then, you know, 50 years down the road, they say, gee, I get laid, hands laid on me by the great prophet. And he told me I was going to be an evangelist and I haven't done anything. Yeah, it was probably because, you, you know, you, 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 <laughs> you've got to process these. Ev everything has got to be processed in the presence. If you've got a prophetic word and you just expect that thing to happen and you don't process that, in the presence of God, it'll probably never happen. So the only reason God gives you prophetic words is to draw you into his presence so you can, you, can, you can find out how to do it in his presence. So what he gets is the fellowship, which he loves, the dependency, the trust, and what you get is the fulfillment of prophecy. Amen. So we're all being drawn into that. It's a whole thing with prayer as well. We're being drawn into that place of, of, of worship, intimacy with God. You can't effectively pray. We're not, it's not going to cut for us anymore. I'm speaking prophetically now. I'm speaking prophetically. But I speak at a, not as an individual level, at a, at a church level. It, it's not going to cut for us anymore as the church. We are growing up very fast. Amen. The body of Christ is growing up very fast. You are on an acceleration curve. Amen. And, and we know it. Amen. We want, we, you know, we've read all about the glorious church and we get excited about when we read about it. But God, what is my part to play in it? What is it that you want me to do? Da David started off with this thing and he, he basically said this, One thing I desire and that will I seek, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life to behold the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in his presence. Psalm 27, verse 4. So David was saying, this is the tabernacle of David stuff. It gets, it's getting back to that again. But basically what David was saying is, he's, he was saying there's just one thing that I want. I don't want two things. God just give me one thing. One thing I desire, and that will I seek. I just want one thing. Basically, to just to sit in your presence and to behold the beauty of the Lord. That is to basically gaze into the eyes of God. That's what that interpretation means. So David was saying, I'm happy just to sit and look at you. And then to inquire is the prayer part. Amen. So he's saying, once, once, I've, once I've, I've, I've got your attention, you've got my attention. We're in this place together. Then I have the right and the authority to pray effectively. Is that making sense? It's how the whole prayer thing works. But it's got to be worship first. Psalm 24, verse 7. To behold the beauty of the Lord and to inquire is the prayer. Beholding is the worship. Inquiring is the prayer. Hallelujah. See, the, the whole church is moving into this realm of stuff. I know I'm speaking prophetically to you, but that's where we're going, right? You, you know, the whole warfare thing and worship thing is highly prophetic. So I can't not speak prophetically to you, but where I believe the church is going and how God is preparing us for it. So, you know, when, when they did the, uh, the first atomic bomb, the, uh, the scientists knew the, the end result. Half a gram would cause an explosion that could wipe out a city. They knew that. What they didn't know was how to trigger the mechanism. They didn't know how to trigger the mechanism. What mechanism do we use so that we can control it until it's ready to be exploded? It was a trigger mechanism, right? That's exactly what the, I believe the Holy Spirit is saying to the church right now. That, that, that the church will understand these trigger mechanisms. Part of it will be prayer. Part of it will, will, will be worship. But the church will start to hear. Is this making any sense? The church will start to hear very clearly what the Holy Spirit is saying. So David then... Um, 
we can learn a lot from, from I'll just give you a little bit of insight here. Um, um, David, when David moved the Ark of the Covenant back to Jerusalem, this, again, this is prophetic. We got a lot of insight into the end time church when we look at the tabernacle of David. It just heaps so much information. It's all there if you know how to look for it. But, but, but God was basically saying to David, bring me back to Jerusalem. So the Philistines had taken the ark. The ark um, was now, they couldn't handle the presence of God. So the ark was now coming back to Jerusalem. So David was a guy. He did it the wrong way the first time. He didn't find out how to do it. He didn't know the trigger mechanisms as it were, if you know what I'm saying. So the, the, he got his mates to do it, and a couple of them died. And then he got uh, the Levites to do it. And so they shouldered um, the presence of God back um, to Jerusalem. And so there's amazing stuff going on here. Um, David knew, first of all, it was time to move the ark. This just didn't happen randomly. It was time to move the ark. So we've got to, as the church, we've got to prophetically discern the hour in which we live. If we discern the time in which we live, there'll be an urgency to draw close to God to find out what we've got to do, right? But if we're just walking through life saying, oh, well, the, you know, I, the best thing is just let me get to heaven and I'll be quite happy. But, uh, but it's, it's, it's this, it says, God, what is it? What is it right now? It's time to move the ark. It's time for your presence to be moved. Amen. What is it that we've got to do to bring your presence and to maintain your presence? So that's, that's the first thing that David did. The second thing is that David knew to build a tent. So we're talking about building. He knew to build a tent so he could put God's presence in the tent. What is that talking about? It's talking about what kind of church is God building? What, what kind of church right now is God building? Because if we just go on the way we've always gone on, you know, I don't know if much is going to change. But things will change. And it's, it's not going to be that difficult. But we've got to be hungry for that change. Amen. Um, he took it to Mount Zion. So the geography was important. He got it exactly to the right spot. So what does that talk about? Um, that, that is a... Zion, do you know that Zion is a heavenly name? There was no mention of Zion. It's a place now, right, where David... You can go there in, to Jerusalem and you'll find Mount Zion. But, but it's a heavenly name, so it, it didn't exist before. So, so the geographical place that God says, set up here, rest, rest my presence here, was something that David got from the heavenly dimension. He looked into the heavenly dimension, and God says, this is the spot. This is what's going to happen in, in the churches, is we're going to get heavenly downloads of exactly what to do. Amen. He was led by the Holy Spirit. I guess what I'm talking about, you know, up until this point is, is the church hearing from the Holy Ghost and doing stuff. Amen. And then David left the tent open 24 hours around the clock, 24-hour worship. And the reason for that was basically David had a revelation of God's presence. Everything I'm talking about tonight is, again, God's presence. So, so how many of you believe that Jesus is coming back for a glorious church, right? Yeah, I mean, it's going to be glorious. It's going to be, the, the glory of, is the presence, but the glory is actually, the glory really is God's presence operating through you as individuals. That's what the glory is. It's not when the things fall from, from the, in the local church from the heavens or wherever. It is, it, and I'm not saying that's not glory, but that's not, that's not the New Testament definition of glory. It's basically people who have tapped into the presence of God and who carry it into the supermarkets Amen. all over the place. Amen. And so... And so David left the, 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 uh, the, the, the tabernacle open 24 hours around the clock. And, uh, and the reason for that was basically God said to David, David, the, he, here's how it worked. God said, I'm giving you a lot of insight. I hope it's not too much into the end time tabernacle of David thing. But basically God said to David, God, uh, David, I'm just going to sit here. I'm just going to be here. And David says, 
I'm just paraphrasing this, okay? And David says, well, if you're going to, if you're going to remain here, then we are going to remain and worship you here. Amen. You see, you see it wasn't like, oh, let's have 24-hour worship. Do you know what I mean? It wasn't like David says, oh, well, let's just have 24. No, no. It, it, David realized God's presence is in the ark. He ain't gone away. God's not going to go away. So if God's not going away, what we're going to do is we're just going to stay here and worship. So obviously he couldn't stay there all the time. So he set up 24 our musicians. Is this making sense? Yeah. Amen. Can you start to see what's coming? Yeah. Amen. And that's why it's going to be like that. It's going to be, you know, we, we can't set up 24 our musicians, but it'll just be open worship. It'll just be open. People will come and go. You know. It'll be like the revival thing we saw recently, except it'll be the, you know, Ash, Ash, Ashford, was it Ash? As, Asbury, yeah, or Ashbury, wherever it was. That, that gives you insight, a little bit of insight into that, but it won't be quite like that. It'll be, um, it'll be the present. People will not be going to a particular place to get revival. Revival will be happening in local churches all over the world. Amen. All over the world. I hope this is okay. It's a bit prophetic, but is, is it okay? <laughs> um, but, it, but we've got to get that insight if we're going to effectively, because you won't be able to fight the devil. You won't be able to warfare against the enemy unless you get some of this, this insight, you know? And so it must have been incredible. So basically said, you know, so, so David says, God, as long as you're here, we're going to worship. And I think what God says, well, as long as you worship, I'm going to stay here. Amen. You and I can maintain the presence of God just through our worship lifestyle. Hallelujah. You know, there's a, there's a, there's a famous professor. I read this book once. And, you know, when David was bringing back the Ark of the Covenant, this is a secular woman, a professor, an Israeli professor. And she'd studied all of this as an, a non-Christian. And she said this, when David brought back the Ark of the Covenant, she said, the enthronement of Yahweh in Jerusalem was an event of global, even cosmic significance. She said, something very big happened that day. I'm quoting from her, before the people's eyes. She says, that event, moving the presence of God into the place where God wanted to be, had cosmic influence. Man, God's going to shake up this world. Amen. He's going to shake the world up. Some people say, well, you know what? See, we, we've got to see this glorious church. <laughs> Listen, God is not coming back tomorrow for a church that's, that's asleep or that's dead or it's in fear. He's coming back for a glorious church because he said he would. Amen. So I don't go along with these guys and say, oh, well, he'll come at any minute, right? The church is not at the right place. We've got to see the, the, the world has got to know that Jesus is alive. It doesn't mean, that doesn't mean that they will follow him. But the, the world has to know that there's a, there's a man called Jesus who died for a sin. They have to know about him. Amen. And they will through believers. Doesn't mean they'll get saved. There'll be a lot of rejection. There will be a lot of persecution. But at the same time, there'll be an incredible glow. All of this happened at the Tabernacle of David. You know, the, the, David's evangelism was extravagant, man. He, he wasn't cowering. He wasn't saying, well, let, 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 let's not offend people. Do you know what I'm saying? It was the very opposite to that. It was the opposite to that. They were dancing in the streets. <laughs> he, had, he, had, he saw worship for the nations. It, in David's time, the, God was exposed to the nations. <laughs> Amen. It, it wasn't hidden. They went crazy, those, those guys. The, the world at that time knew there was a God. Amen. They knew he, there was a God. Nearly finished. And then we'll have a little break. So um, it was face to face. There was a prophetic flow. This is another thing how it's uh, just a couple of last things here. Um, there was a prophetic flow in David's tabernacle. Um, in fact, he set up these, guys, these recorder guys. 
And uh, the reason, this is in 1 Chronicles chapter 16. And the reason that David did was he, he set up recorders. The recorders were supposed to record what was taking place. What was taking place? Well, there was dialogue between David and, and God and God and David. And these recorders were writing down everything, the, the dialogue that was going on. And the proof of that is the Psalms. The Psalms were basically the dialogue that was going on between. That's where that stuff comes from, between David and God. Amen. So David's focus was on the presence of God. That was the tabernacle of David. Um, and then let me just throw this, this in as we, as we uh, go to our break. Um, what time did we start? Half past. Well, I got a little bit, little bit longer then. It's five past. Um, so, so David's focus was the presence of God. The, um, the, there, was, there was nothing else that was important to David, but having said that, everything else happened because that was the focus. You know? So the whole warring thing, the enemies were subdued. The, the financial release was unbelievable, you know. There was so much wealth that came into David. That's how David set it up for Solomon. David gave Solomon all the wealth to build what he built. I mean, it came from David. The wealth, the, the, there's a whole connection there between, between uh, uh, praise and worship and, and financial release. The Bible says, let the people praise thee, O Lord, and let all the people praise thee. Then the earth shall yield her increase. Amen. So increase is waiting for your praise. Every increase is waiting for your praise. <laughs> Amen. Hallelujah. He brought them out with silver and gold, and there was none feeble among the tribes. Amen. He brought them out. Deliverance. The church is going to experience that deliverance with silver and gold. And there was none feeble. There was no sickness, no disease. In fact, during David's time, there was a guy called Asaph. Asaph was one of the chief musicians in the tabernacle. And Asaph, his name actually means healer. He was a musical genius, by the way. And he was the, he was the musical arranger. So he did all the arranging in the tabernacle for all these musicians and singers. But his name meant healer or one who could collect people together. He had an anointing to gather people together through worship. And, and it says there in, the, in the, the Hebrew, it says, and remove the hearts and reproaches, even leprosy, which was the big killer in those days. That was the equivalent to cancer today, right? So his anointing in music was a healing anointing. This was taking place in the tabernacle of David. So there was a massive healing anointing taking place during David's time at the tabernacle. That same anointing is going to be far greater in the end time church. Massive healing anointings will take place just spontaneously. Amen. Hallelujah. In fact, a lot of, a lot of the, the, he arranged the music, so a lot of the music that he would have arranged would have been centered around healing. So it was really important to God for his people to get healed. Amen? <laughs> and not to be sick. That is a huge, huge thing. Amen? In fact, long life, I've, I've spoken quite a lot in this book on, on worship heals about the connection. There is incredible connections. You know, let's let just close with this and then we will close for 10 minutes. But um, we'll have a break rather. But if, if, you think a bit, if you think about the simplicity of thanksgiving, so let's just take that one thing. Because they did that a lot then. They would thank God all the time. But if you think about thanksgiving, if you think about thanksgiving, when you are thankful, doesn't it make you feel good? Doesn't it? it? It makes you feel good, right, if, if you're thankful for something. You just feel good. That feel good is science now is catching up. But that feel good 
is such an enormous healing effect in your entire body. Thanksgiving. Amen. So that's now if, if someone would give you something. You feel good. That feel good has an enormous effect on your entire body, health-wise. But when you start to give God thanks, it has multiple times more strength in terms of feel good. Your body will start to, your body will start to feel the difference. Hallelujah. Amen. Thanks for watching Victory Christian Center. For more content, please subscribe to our YouTube channel or you can subscribe to our podcasts on Spotify, iTunes or Google Podcasts. Check out our website at victory.net.nz. We'll see you again soon.